Vampire The Masquerade Bloodlines is among my favorite games of all time. In my mind, it's second to only Bioshock as far as all the games ever go, and VTM is severely undeserving of its cult status. Bloodlines is a game that deserved far more notoriety and sales than it got, and it's one of the best written games of all times, even with all its bumps and blemishes. For like the maybe 12 of you who clicked on this video without knowing what Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, also known as VTMB, also known as Bloodlines, let me give you a rundown. VTMB is an RPG video game released in late 2004 by developers Troika Games. Troika Games primarily consisted of three developers that made the original Fallout games who wanted to push the envelope of what's in a video game RPG. So, they made a game centered around the existing tabletop property Vampire the Masquerade from the World of Darkness properties. It incorporated first-person action elements into the game to help with that whole keeping the RPG fresh and actionable bit. Unfortunately, due to a forced early release by Activision on what was arguably the worst day ever to release a video game, Bloodlines did very poorly in the sales department and was significantly docked in their review scores across the boards thanks to its overtly unfinished state. Within three months of Bloodlines release, Troika was no more. VTMB was brought to a much more accessible state eventually though, over the last 15 years thanks to some extremely dedicated modders. Between that and the cult classic status of Bloodlines, buzz about this game stayed alive long enough to where now it's relevant again because we're getting a sequel in the foreseeable future. Time for a crazy true story and a quick confession. A few years back, when I was experimenting with streaming on Twitch.tv, I was doing a playthrough of Bloodlines for the month of October for an audience of, like, less than 10 people. Out of the blue, someone from White Wolf pops into my chat, all stoked that I'm playing Bloodlines, and started talking about how White Wolf was currently shopping around for a studio to make a new Bloodlines game with. And wouldn't you know it, about a year later, the deal comes out that White Wolf and Paradox are going to make another Vampire the Masquerade game. As for that confession, I have to admit, that I am certainly not an OG fan of VTMB. I was like 10 or 11 when it came out, and I saw the review on G4 Tech TV's X-Play, and I was stoked, but my parents weren't about to go to the store and buy me a game with a cover that looks like this. I tried the game eight years later in 2012, when the game was recommended to me by a friend, but I wasn't able to get out of Santa Monica as I got frustrated with the audio and physics issues. Eventually, someone pointed me out to the fan patch, and it was like night and day. It took me quite a while to come around to Bloodlines, but I'm glad I did. Why do those former anecdotes matter? Why am I padding this video? Well, it's a segue into the big question. Was Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines as good as we remember it being? The fantastic work that the unofficial patch team has done has contributed quite a bit to our rose-tinted or maybe perhaps blood-tinted view of Bloodlines, which flies in the face of the initial reviews and sales figures, which ultimately led to the downfall of Troika Games and left Bloodlines in the sorry state that it was in, requiring a massive fan patch. Perhaps a look in retrospective at Bloodlines' extremely troubled development development and the perfect storm of bad luck that was its release window is in order to figure this out. Let's talk about that development in the history of the game. Troika, which is Russian for three of a kind, was founded by three of the original creators of the Fallout franchise who saw the writing on the wall at Interplay and wanted to do their own thing. Troika had two games that were mostly under their belt before Bloodlines that were done under two separate publishers. Both times around, the games were released in an unpolished state that detracted from an otherwise well put together and fleshed out game. Bloodlines was going to be published under Activision, which would have been their third publisher in the span of the three games that they had made. That's not a good look for the studio. And it meant that Troika had to go through the courtship process of being the noob kid on the block yet again. When Valve caught wind of this new ambitious project that Troika wanted to make, they gave Troika Games an opportunity to give this hot new engine they were working on called Source a try. Source was an extremely promising video game engine, which had some very promising physics on it, and some really, really good facial animation technology. There were a couple of catches though. One was that Troika was not allowed to release the video game they were making before Valve was able to release their own upcoming game that used the Source engine. 
And the other catch was that they would be working on an alpha version of the Source engine as it wasn't finished at the time they were developing Bloodlines. Source likely wasn't all that polished while Troika was making the game, since it was most likely Valve still trying to polish and figure out what was going on in the engine. You can kind of see right off the bat in the early stages with Smiling Jack, the company really wanted to show off all those fancy facial animations, but as soon as you get into the fighting what have you, all the physics of the bodies get all wonky, at least in the unpatched version of the game. Seriously, those facial animations are insane for the time. Like, better than some facial animations in games that have came out over a decade later. Regardless, it's not exactly easy to build your game on an engine that's only half-built itself. And it wouldn't be a troubled game development without having a whole lot of delays to get involved in. So, of course, the game got delayed a lot. The game had multiple setbacks, and at first, Activision was cool with it. But later on, Activision was done with Troika's shenanigans and told them they had to release the game as soon as possible. Finished or not. Lucky for them, they would cite that Valve wouldn't allow them to release their game before Valve was able to release their own game, so that gave Troika a few months to get the bare bones of the game finished during an insane crunch session. Yeah, the game was playable when it came out, for the most part, but it was clear that it was unfinished when it hit the stores. We'll get into the broken, buggy mess that was the unpatched version of Bloodlines in a minute, but suffice it to say that the game was outright unfinished at launch. It was serviceable, as we'll see later, but reviewers and your average gamer were able to easily sniff out that Troika barely had enough time to make sure that the ending of the game worked, and the whole thing was a mess. When Bloodlines launched, it faced a lot of stiff competition in the game's market. Like, a crazy amount of competition. Within a 30-day radius of Bloodlines' launch, there was Halo 2, Metal Gear Solid 3, Need for Speed Underground 2, Metroid Prime 2, Godzilla Save the Earth, Grand Theft Auto, San Andreas, World of Friggin' Warcraft, the launch of the Nintendo DS, and all the killer apps that came out with it, and one more game. Remember how we mentioned earlier that Troika was not allowed to release Bloodlines before Valve was able to release their own game? However, Activision demanded that they release Bloodlines as soon as possible? Well, that left exactly one day that Troika was allowed to launch Bloodlines. The same day as the insanely anticipated sequel to Valve's smash hit game Half-Life. It was bad enough that Bloodlines was coming out during an extremely competitive year with lots of highly anticipated titles from some very popular franchises all coming out within a month of Bloodlines, but releasing the game on the same day as Half-Life 2 has to be the single worst day to release a game ever. While VTMB did receive coverage, it got eclipsed by the spectacle that was Half-Life 2. While Bloodlines was praised for its story, diverse means of accomplishing tasks, voice work, and so on, nearly every review was punctuated with how the game was buggy and very obviously unfinished. That's not exactly good for sales. During Bloodlines' initial run, it sold about 85,000 copies, and considering the delays and the ambition of this project, this did not bode well for Troika Games. Activision was probably pretty upset at them. This had the unfortunate side effect of solidifying Troika's reputation as making very ambitious games that get tragically played with delays and bugs. Activision was now the third publisher that Troika had worked with where these events had happened, so it would be very hard trying to convince a fourth publisher the next time around that things would be different. Troika did try to hit the ground running. They had created a pitch for a post-apocalyptic RPG that was shopped around for publishers, but nobody was really biting. Allegedly, this could have been what Fallout 3 would have been, according to the Troika devs, but they were ultimately outbid by Bethesda for the ticket to make Fallout 3. Things weren't looking so good for Troika. Over the next couple of months, Troika was forced to do two rounds of layoffs before being whittled down to the founding three, plus a few others trying to squash bugs with what little resources they had left. I, I can't imagine how that must have felt. You're hoping that this game is the one that rockets your studio to the forefront of gaming and makes you a regular name in cyber cafes and other nerd hangouts the world over, but instead, thanks to some really bad timing, you're forced to release a game too early that gets nowhere near enough sales to make back the investment, and now, instead of fat Christmas bonuses, you're handing out layoff notices to all your employees who worked so hard to make this game the best that it could be given the circumstances, and that's just awful. I really feel for everyone there. After the two rounds of layoffs, their attempts to patch Bloodlines weren't enough to boost sales, and Troika was 
unable to secure funding for another project. Troika was formally considered defunct as of February 2005. It was no exaggeration among reviewers and gaming press when they complained about how Bloodlines was not finished when it hit the stores. Pretty much anyone can see it for themselves that if you don't install the fan patch, this game is a nightmare. Right off the bat, if you don't turn off the sound features, the game is going to sound like you're in a rundown movie theater in some dying mall, where it's been decades since they made an attempt to resync the speakers. Bloodlines also had resolution issues and wasn't very 16x9 friendly unless you had the fan patch installed. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Bloodlines has comically broken physics. Sometimes when you hit a guy hard enough to send them flying, and they land in just the right way, they'll float in the void and start spinning violently, not knowing what to do with themselves. Sometimes when you'd enter an area, you'd hear a bunch of stuff clanging about, like it didn't know what it was supposed to be doing with itself, and oh no, here comes gravity, we should probably try and stick to the floor. In the unpatched version, whenever you skip the dialogue while talking to a female NPC, their chest would violently shake in a way that the human physique certainly does not naturally move in. I know we had just made Jiggle Physics a thing with 3D graphics and everybody was going nuts about it with that dead or alive beach volleyball, but I don't think this was intended. Then to wrap it all up, your immersion would be immediately broken if you looked up into the city sky because all the power lines would be flailing around like the birds were skipping rope with them. Early source engine physics were wild. There was also content in the game that was outright unfinished. There's a couple quests that eventually got restored and put back into the game via the plus patch, one being a pretty simple fetch quest, and another having multiple stages and an entire level dedicated to itself that was pieced together via abandoned textures and a trip to the Los Angeles Public Library. There's also at least one instance of certain endings not being available without the patch, and an instance where you won't be able to do one quest if you do another, despite seemingly it being the intention to have all options on the table. The plus patch does fix these things and put them back into the game, but the plus patch did not exist when this game first came out. Perhaps the most egregious sign that this game wasn't finished on launch is not necessarily a bug or an overtly missing feature, but the game's balance. This is gonna be a bit of a ride, hang in there with me. Earlier in the game, this isn't too noticeable. You can get through most of Santa Monica and the bulk of downtown without running into any sort of trouble. The snags you hit at this stage of the game are still at the point where there are plenty of other quests you can go and do in order to dump some experience into a combat skill and eventually power your way through tougher enemies. But as you get further in the game, you simply can't get enough experience points from other side quests to make up the difference in experience points you'll need to get to a combat level that's high enough to have a shot at taking out harder enemies later in the game. This wouldn't be too much of an issue thanks to the option to stealth, magic, or smooth talk your way through most of the situations in Bloodline with complementary skill sets that let you pursue a certain way of doing things. Some vampire clans, like the ever-freakish-looking Nosferatu, have benefits for non-combat abilities and infiltration. The Gangrels have raw, animalistic power. Venture have speech powers, but Tremere and Malkavian get them too, so they kind of suck. And it's too bad that at certain points in the late game, you're going to be put into situations that can only be resolved with a good old-fashioned fight. Take a look at this monster right here. This is what hitting the wall looks like in a video game, but we'll get to her in a second. On top of initially having the game be wide open to different methods of solving your problems, some of which will yield results that are much better than just fighting your way through things, this game will eventually corral you into open combat. The two main ways you're going to go about combat are either going to be melee or ranged. Unarmed is there, but it's more beneficial for feeding on higher level enemies, so you're probably going to have points in it anyway. My experiences over the courses of my playthroughs through Bloodlines is that melee is heavily favored over range early in the game and that most early game firearms are next to useless up until you can get the Glock in the downtown area. Firearms won't really be a competitive alternative to melee weapons until you get the Cult Anaconda or the Desert Eagle. Side note, this is possibly the most OP we've ever seen the Desert Eagle in a video game, with its ability to hit the wart off a Nosferatu from across the sewers, and the fact that it hits harder than the SWAT rifle once you get that modded into the game. Guns are really downplayed in the tutorial, with Smiling Jack overtly saying that they're not very handy against undead and other otherworldly enemies. If you try to use them in your first combat-centered quest in Santa Monica without having Serenity, an ability that basically allows you to move like the vampire and an interview 
interview with a vampire, you're going to have a very bad time. The next gun you get, the shotgun, does do pretty good damage, but it's so slow that it's near useless unless, again, you have the super speed ability, Serelity. Later on, midway through your time in downtown, you'll get access to the Glock, submachine guns, and what's supposed to be an auto shotgun. Well, the Glock is okay and ammo for it is pretty plentiful since it's the gangbanger's choice in this game, it's not as good as the melee alternatives you'll have access to at this point. The auto shotgun's ammo is prohibitively expensive, and whichever submachine gun you get, you'll leave yourself saying, wait, I dropped all these skill points into firearms and dropped several hundred dollars for this? Guns are pretty useless when compared to melee weapons for the first two thirds of Bloodlines. Between the knife and the baseball you get at the very beginning of the game being solid low level starting options and if you level into being able to use the fire axe you get from the hotel, that's going to carry you through most of the game until you find the sledgehammer laying around or get the magic samurai sword. Both of those hit like a truck. They're certainly going to hold you over until you can get your hands on the bush hook in Chinatown. However, as you get into the thick of the Chinatown area, you're presented with more and more situations where enemies are going to be well armed with ranged weapons who aren't simply standing around in a place where it's easy to sneak up on them. So unless you went hard into stealth, you're going to have a really hard time making your way through combat areas with just melee weapons. It's hard to rush a guy that's dug in behind a series of ramparts who's got an automatic weapon trained on you. There are some abilities that help you close the distance, such as Presence, Blood Buff, Potence, and good old fashioned Serality, but once you close the gap, you're still going to have a hard time if you don't have something to shoot back with. If you haven't figured it out by the time you roll into the Tong nightclub, then you're going to need to be sinking those extra points you've been picking up all into firearms so you can use the Desert Eagle or something else that hits hard from a distance. It's nearly impossible to finish this game unless you're running the plus patch. Without the plus patch, the farthest you're going to get is likely the end of the Quajin Temple. Assuming you somehow made it through the Society of Leopold without guns, you might have been able to squeak by the Sabat Assault if they gave you a lot of blood dolls strategically placed around the area, and you might even take out that Shamisi in its final form after a few dozen tries. But melee is not going to work against Mistress Ming Zhao. This is not a fight that you can easily melee your way out of thanks to Zhao's attack and her little wormlings she spawns that run to the other side of the room and get huge. Stealth is of no benefit here, because it's a straight up fight that you can't get out of unless you decide to take the worst ending in the game. Unless you've got Serelity, or you knew from a previous playthrough that you're going to need guns for the late game, you're gonna just get wrecked again and again and again. You can try to melee, but you're going to have to resort to either cheating stuff into the game or just starting over. You'll likely only have low level guns that aren't worth much against Zhao, and maybe the flamethrower, which requires no gun skill, but even at a full complement of ammo, the flamethrower is only going to take out maybe one fifth of Ming Zhao's health, so you're still screwed. At least if you somehow manage to kill Ming Zhao without the use of guns, you'll gain enough experience points to cover the gap into the next zone, and you'll likely be able to have a Desert Eagle and AUG ammo around, and you might have a chance against the Sheriff. I'm calling this a side effect of the crunch that Troika went through towards the end of development. Perhaps they didn't have the time to figure out non-combat alternatives for the late game, and only got as far as maybe midway through Hollywood for all the things that are not shooting, stabbing, or punching. Most of the missions from Chinatown and on are all almost exclusively combat-centered, with only a couple of opportunities for stealth or diplomacy. Maybe they didn't have enough resources for more QA testing at that point, and were just more focused on making sure the game runs and that you can finish it, and any sort of balance in the later game was something they just didn't have time for. What matters here is that unless you get really lucky or have advanced knowledge, you're not going to be able to get very far into the late game. Lucky for us, a decade after the launch and then some, we have the fan patch that will fix this, but we're gonna get to that in a second. In spite of everything I just said, Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines is a brilliant, immersive experience. 
This is the only game where I'll willingly just go and get lost stalking the alleyways of Los Angeles by night and just taking it all in. Bloodlines is one of the best combinations of story and atmosphere I've ever seen in a video game. If you can make it through all the bugs, unfinished quests, and hitting the wall in combat segments, you'll get the experience of being turned into a vampire and being thrown into a world that doesn't seem to care about your survival, but against all odds, you'll grow into a terrifying creature of the night and a power player in the supernatural society. Everyone you meet is a fleshed out character with their own motives and quirks and you'll get the feeling that you're not the only person in the world doing anything but just one of the many trying to pull the strings in this web of corruption and spooky things called the world of darkness. The areas themselves feel like they're characters too. Every place has a certain vibe that sets the mood for that part of the game and even though I can't really play it because copyright reasons, you know exactly what song is playing right now as I approach this nightclub. As you get more experience points and complete more quests, you'll find yourself getting more pull until even the major players in the LA vampire scene are beginning to look to you for what's gonna happen next. Vampire the Masquerade is part of a series of tabletop games called The World of Darkness, where instead of rangers and bards, you play as vampires, werewolves, and all the bad kinds of wizards. Between the rule book and the existing lore, Troika already had a strong foundation to build their own version of the World of Darkness, and they delivered. Bloodlines did an excellent job of not only existing within the World of Darkness, but also contributing to it too. Every location is its own little world, and it has its own things going on and its own story to tell. This game thinks about just about everything too. Already completed the game a few times? Your old characters are going to show up in the Noctune Theater. Characters will mention choices you made or the lack thereof. Don't want to do that Ming Zhao fight? You can pick her side for the ending, which ultimately is the least satisfying of the group, but hey, you don't have to do that tough fight. The characters and the NPCs really sell this world. Everyone has something to say about everything, and they have their own goals that you can either help or hinder to your own benefit. Everyone, from bounty hunters to annoying ghoul groupies, have their own plans which might overlap with your own. And there are already videos that go into depth about just how good the voice acting is, so I'll be brief here. Bloodlines is one of the best voice acting ensembles in a video game that I've ever seen, and everyone in it is bringing their A game to each and every character they do. Even the minor characters that only serve as like a quick 30 second gag. You'll probably have a favorite or two by the time you're done with your first playthrough. Mine is our man Maximilian Strauss here, who is the head of the Tremere clan in the region, and in spite of everything, he respects you because he can sense that there's something about you. He doesn't try to play you, he is forward with his motivations about the gargoyle, and if you're Tremere and you're a bro to him, you get a nice apartment without having to deal with LaCroix. There's a reason to do every second, third, fourth, and fifth campaign in this game. Just about every class you pick has a unique version of the story with having an entirely different style of play. What you've seen for most of this video is a playthrough of the Tremere clan, which I personally consider to be the not quite easy mode, but definitely a fun way to play because while you don't have serality for your gun abilities, you do have thaumaturgy. Thaumaturgy is an at times obscenely OP discipline of blood magic. Plus, you get Domination, which is the Ventru's good ability. Seriously though, Thaumaturgy is one of the most insanely overpowered things in this game. Just take a look at this. So on top of all of that carnage, you get mind control on top of that because why not? But maybe you don't want to hang out with Maximilian Strauss in his magical house and do awesome blood magic all day. There's the Bruja and the Toreador, which are kind of like the vanilla, genuine easy class modes. Then there's the Malkavians, which is one of the best new game pluses out there in the world of gaming. It's weird as hell as first if you do your run as Malkavian, but when you go the second time around, it really does feel like you have the power to see the future. Also, the dialogue is hilarious, but at the same time insightful. Knowing what you know, it now makes perfect sense that Jeanette and Therese could understand you without missing a beat. There's also the gang girl, which offers a skill set that encourages frenzy instead of telling you not to do it. And the only time the unarmed combat skill is going to be a priority and something useful for something other than feeding on the enemies in the later part of the game. I don't know, I'm a Tremere main, which is kind of like the anti gang girl, so I don't have much experience here. Where it gets really interesting, interesting though is the Nosferatu. 
as the game becomes almost entirely a different experience owing to, you know, how you're so ugly, the act of being seen is considered a violation of the sacred masquerade that you're supposed to be upholding. Lucky for you, you get a big fat bonus to your infiltration skills like hacking, lockpicking, and obfuscation, which is the stealth discipline that makes you become effectively invisible. It's also pretty handy that this version of Los Angeles has an extremely spacious sewer system that will take you to just about every point of interest in the game. As a consolation prize for not being able to go out in public, you'll get some pretty interesting reactions from the NPCs that you do have to come in contact with. Bloodlines is a game that sticks with you even after you're done playing it. This particular playthrough I did for footage took me a little under 28 hours to get through the end of the credits. And after that, whatever you're gonna play next isn't gonna feel as good as it was before immediately compared to Bloodlines. After this, I was playing Warcraft 3 and Black Mesa and uh, it just didn't feel the same. Those are both excellent games, but how do you like compare to Smiling Jack and the chaos that is most of Hollywood? Bloodlines is a game where every skill counts for something other than percentages to your odds or a dice roll. All the characters live in a world rather than exist for a quest line. Perception isn't just ticks on a radar screen, but the difference between being able to notice that videotape at the foot of a speaker or a small little business card that falls to the ground as a hack reality TV show host runs away from a hospital and then having to go and Google hospital quest broken only to realize that you're a moron. Bloodlines is a sort of game where you can just hang out in a spot and watch the world go by or catch up on some local vampire politics that are in no way related to any sort of quest you're doing right now. Bloodlines is a masterclass of world building and unique experiences in a video game. And it gets even better. You know all those problems that were went off on earlier in the video? All of those get fixed with a fan patch, and a really good one too. While it can't necessarily undefunct Troika Games, the VTMB unofficial patch fixes nearly all the problems that exist with Bloodlines. The patch is so synonymous with the game that it's literally pre-packaged with it if you get it from GOG instead of Steam. Weird audio issues? Gone. Framing issues with NPCs when you're talking to them? Gone. Physics? Back what you'd reasonably expect them to be. Broken quest? Fixed. And this is just the baseline patch. The patch started being worked on shortly after Troika went defunct in the early 2005. And it's still being worked on to this day. Yes, that's nearly 15 years of dedicated fan patching on this game. This is mostly spearheaded by one Wesp5, who while didn't initially start the work on fan patching and had zero background in coding or game development, Wesp5 was pretty upset that the game he got wasn't working, so he reached out to the devs from Troika and asked them how to fix it. One thing led to another, and now when the credits roll, there are more people listed on the fan patch than there are developers from Troika Games. The patch is better maintained than a good number of AAA games I've played over the years, and the people behind this patch have been extremely dedicated to making Bloodlines everything that it should have been. In one case, they even went as far as having someone take a field trip to go out to the Los Angeles Public Library in order to get a feel for the layout of the place so that they could help restore a quest that only had a few leftover textures and references to it in the game and it happened to be set in the LA Public Library. Some existing levels were redesigned too in order to make them more enjoyable and easier to navigate, like getting a shortcut that lets you just skip the entire sewer level because that is the only way to fix that level, which yeah, it's the best thing that could have been done. I'm sorry guys, the sewer level just was a, a crime. The team behind the unofficial patch have restored so much content to the game and fixed so many things that eventually the creators had to split it into two patches. One is the regular patch that fixes the existing issues with the game and the other being called the plus patch that does everything the base patch does, plus reinstating the unfinished quest, reworking the levels, fixing experience point balance, and so on. There's also a secret ending related to one of the clans, but I'm gonna let you experience that one for yourself. I personally recommend the plus patch for people wanting to play this game who have it before, because it alleviates the big issues with weapons that I spent like eight minutes ranting about by giving you a lot more experience points in the early game that will lead you to have all your skills you need to get by, plus enough extra points for guns so that when the time comes that melee just isn't useful anymore, it's going to not be a problem. It's not as good as finding a way to make melee more viable in the later game, but it's a lot easier to pull this off without reworking entire boss fights, and I don't even want to try to think about having a sword duel with the sheriff anyway. The fan patch isn't the only patch either. There's also the Camarilla edition, which rebalances some of the game's mechanics, and among other things, the Final Knight's Total Conversion mod, which tells an entirely different story from Bloodlines. These are just a couple of the many, many 
many mods for Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. While it was made on an alpha version of the Source Engine that didn't have an SDK for modders to work with, Bloodlines is still a Source game, which makes it highly moddable. As far as an answer to the question posed in this title, I'd say that unless you were one of the original 85,000 people who bought Bloodlines during its initial sales run, this game is definitely as good as you remembered it. The fan patch is so synonymous with this game that it's now packaged with it in some cases, or it's at least the first thing you see on the community page when you buy the game. I cannot stress enough that this game is worth playing if you haven't already, or if you're into immersive sims in general, or just very, very good games. It's also got a ton of replay value based on the different classes and different experiences you'll get from them. If you have somehow not played this game yet, I have included a link to the Humble store in the description of this video. This is a way for you to download the game through Humble, which can and will support charity through your actions, and it also supports me a little if you buy the game through this link. The Humble key will work on both Steam and GOG, however, I would highly suggest you redeem it through GOG because that will just default the patch onto it, and you won't have to worry about wonky physics or anything crazy like that. Bloodlines is the epitome of a cult classic video game. The initial run had less than 100,000 sales, and to this day, it's barely broken half a million after 15 years. That's nowhere near the numbers you get for a popular indie title or an extremely mediocre AAA game. I'd love to see Bloodlines break 1 million sales someday, but I only think that's gonna happen if we see it go on like a Humble Bundle or as a free tie-in, things that I very rarely associate with games published by Activision. And speaking of Bloodlines, Bloodlines 2 is coming. At the time of recording this, it looks like we're going to be able to play as all of the Camarilla classes from the first game, and maybe we might have a chance at some of the Sabbat related ones much later down the line in expansion territory. That's just a guess though. This is going to be the first game in a very long time that I out and out pre-order the Deluxe Edition of, because that stop sign and I have a score to settle. I've got some things I'd personally like to see in the game that seem plausible, like a certain thin blood couple that ran off to the Pacific Northwest. It'd be nice to see them again, or even have us be shown the ropes about being a thin blood by those two. And while the Tremere aren't doing so well in the tabletop canon right now, it'd be really nice to see some variant of the Tremere ending where Strauss steps in and tries to take control of LA, like the best ending of Bloodlines. Like I can dream, right? There's also the matter of the other Bloodlines game that got announced recently, The Vampire the Masquerade, Cotteries of New York, which is said to be going live in the fourth quarter of 2019, but all we have right now are a few pictures of concept art of the New York City cityscape, that's a redundant saying, but whatever, and a synopsis that it's Anarchs versus the Camarilla as usual. I'm not gonna hold my breath on this one until we get something a bit more concrete on it. That's gonna be it for today. I hope this has been as informative and interesting to you as it was for me to research, write, and record this. Please consider subscribing if you'd like to help me make bigger and better videos in the future. And I do run a Patreon where you can help support me. This isn't the last we're going to see of the Vampire the Masquerade series, and stay tuned for more spooky video games in the near future, cause I love me some Halloween in July. In the meantime, if you're really hankering for more Vampire the Masquerade, I'd highly suggest checking out a YouTube channel called Outstar. Outstar has her own playthrough of Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines on her channel, where she goes through the Nosferatu if you want to get a feel for how they play compared to the Tremere in this video, and she's also actively uploading a series of videos helping explain the classes in the Camarilla as they're being revealed for the Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2. I'd highly suggest giving it a watch. Thank you to all my patrons who helped make these videos possible and for now sign offs are stupid and i just don't know how to do them bye this boy we got maximum relaxation right here is that comfortable he's like there's a there's posts here because i suck at assembling furniture and my hoodie is hanging on one of the posts because I, I keep it there between going to the gym. <laughs> and this boy. No. Yes. <laughs> He's just all zonked out. Like, yes, this is a comfy pillow. Alright, time to waddle my ass over. Oh, you're not, you're not comfy anymore? Can't get a close-up of the comfy post?
Would you like a? Oh, you would not like a scrunch. Stop filming. You've been sleeping up here all day. Go get a job. I'm serious. Start filling out applications. 